today on Grace To You. The first coming of Christ was a veiled coming. To really understand who Jesus Christ is, you have to see Him unveiled. And the best place to see Him unveiled is in the apocalypse. The first time He came and a star marked His arrival. The next time He comes, all the stars of heaven will fall and the whole of heaven will collapse. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We started uh, having Christmas uh, celebrations and Christmas services together back in 1969. That's a long time. That's, that's a lot longer than some of you have been alive. I understand that. And every Christmas I look forward to it. Sometimes people say to me, don't you run out of things to say? So far I haven't run out of things to say. Uh, it's an inexhaustible um, resource that the Word of God is to deal with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, in thinking about how we might address that this year in our time of worship of the Christ child, I thought it might be good to, uh, to move into the future. So I've called this message Christmas Future, kind of borrowed that from Charles Dickens who wrote A Christmas Carol, and we all remember Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past. Um, very familiar, very beloved story. And it's fine, and a lot of times uh, around Christmas we go to the past, and we've been doing that even in some of the songs we have sung. But I, I want us to look at Christmas future. The first coming of Christ was a veiled coming. Wesley got it right in that magnificent hymn, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. His glory, His majesty was veiled. The next time He comes, it will be unveiled. The first time He came, His glory was veiled. The second time He comes, His humanity will be veiled. The first time He came, His humanity was on display for all to see, and that is all that most people ever saw. There were only three people who saw His glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, just three, Peter, James, and John. The rest of the world saw only His humanity. The next time He comes, the whole world will see His glory. His humanity will be hidden. To really understand who Jesus Christ is, you have to see Him unveiled. And the best place to see Him unveiled is in the apocalypse, the unveiling. So open your Bible to the book of Revelation. And throughout the book of Revelation, there are titles and there are statements made concerning Christ that take the veil off and reveal who He really is. Not just a baby in a manger, that becomes very clear in the book of Revelation when we see Him in His unveiled glory. The first time He came and a star marked His arrival. The next time He comes, all the stars of heaven will fall and the whole of heaven will collapse. The first time He came, wise men and shepherds brought Him gifts. The next time He comes, He will bring the gifts, the rewards for His people. The first time He came, there was no room for Him in a small inn. The next time He comes, His glory will fill the entire earth. The first time He came, just a few attended His arrival. The next time He comes, every eye will see Him. The first time He came as a helpless baby, the second time He comes as the sovereign king and judge over all. In the Old Testament, He was seen as the angel of the Lord. In the New Testament, it was the angels who announced His arrival. In the Gospels, He appears as an infant and as a twelve-year-old child and as a man and then as a miracle-working preacher. And then as a suffering Savior, and then as a risen conqueror, conqueror of death. In the epistles, He is presented 
as the teacher, as the mediator, as the shepherd, as the bridegroom, as the head of the church, and as the great high priest. All of those are true of Him. All of those add to the dimensions of His glory. But some of the most vivid and stunning portraits are those in the book of Revelation of the unveiled Christ. In fact, if you look at the first verse of the book of Revelation, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the book is. It is the unveiling, the apocalypsis, the unveiling of the Son of God. So this is Christmas future, not the view so common at His first coming, but the full view of an unveiled Christ. Now Revelation 12 does make a reference to His birth. Revelation 12 and verse 5 says this, she gave birth to a son, a male child. That is the only reference in the book of Revelation to His birth. And immediately it is followed with these words, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. So having just once mentioned His birth, it moves immediately to the great theme of the book of Revelation, that is His triumphant return when He comes as sovereign Lord, King, and Judge. Obviously, as we know, the gospel focus is on His coming in lowliness, His coming in humility to serve and to give His life as a ransom for sin. He lived as a man whose glory was hidden, and when He returns, His humanity will be hidden and His glory fully manifest. To see the unveiled Christ, we need to look at the book of Revelation. Now I'm going to ask you to work a little bit. You're going to have to hang in there. I hope you have a Bible. There's one near you uh, somewhere along where the hymnal is. You're going to want to work with us through this to see this unveiling. We're going to go from away in the manger to the hallelujah chorus. We're going to cover the final triumphant declaration of the Spirit of God in the visions given to John that unveil who this child really is. This is the full picture of Christ. Let's start in chapter 1 with the first title that is given to Him in verse 5. He is identified in verse 1, Jesus Christ. He is identified in verse 2, Jesus Christ. He is identified in verse 5, Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. First, He is the faithful witness there in verse 5, the faithful witness. That is, one who always speaks accurately and truthfully, one who always gives the facts. That's what a faithful witness does, giving perfect testimony, absolutely accurate testimony. And the testimony that Jesus gives to God, to man, to sin, to righteousness, to judgment, to salvation, to heaven, hell, life, and death, testimony that He gives to anything and everything on which He speaks is absolutely faithful. In fact, in chapter 3 and verse 14, He is called the Amen the faithful and true witness. The amen, the faithful and true witness. Amen means so let it be. If He says it, then that's how it is. That's how it is. In John 18, 37, He said, for this I was born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. In a world of lies, under the control of the arch liar, Satan, you can trust everything that Christ says. He cannot lie. He is God. He is holy God, and God cannot lie. He speaks flawlessly about everything. All His claims are true. All His promises are true. All His assessments are true. All His judgments, decisions, actions are in perfect harmony with truth, including even His judgment, so that at the very beginning of this book of judgment and reward, we can be sure that every judgment and every reward is based on faithful testimony to the facts. He is the faithful witness. Secondly, in that same verse, verse 5, He is the firstborn from the dead or of the dead, either way. 
It doesn't mean that He's the first person to ever be raised from the dead. There were some before Him. In 1 Kings chapter 17, there is a resurrection. In 2 Kings chapter 4, there is a resurrection, and then again in chapter 13. So we have three occasions in the Old Testament where a prophet of God, by the power of God, raised someone from the dead. We also know from Matthew 9, Luke 7, and John 11 that Jesus raised people from the dead. So this all happened before He was ever raised. Now it's very rare. Those are the only references we have to resurrections among all the hundreds of millions of people who have come and gone in the world. Only those resurrections, very rare. But this isn't talking about that. The word here is prototokos in the Greek, and it means the primary one, the preeminent one. It's not the first chronology-wise, it's the first in terms of preeminence, the most important one. Rank is the issue here. Of all who have ever been raised or ever will be raised in the future, He ranks first. Psalm 89, 27 records the words of God Himself, and He speaks about Messiah. He says, I shall also make Him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. The firstborn is the supreme one, the premier one, the preeminent one, the highest ranking one, higher than the kings of the earth. This is the right of the firstborn to possess the full estate of the Father. Revelation records the future fulfillment of that promise. We'll see that very soon, that He, because He is the preeminent one, He is the Son of God, will inherit the entire possession of God. Also in verse 5, a third title is given to Him. He is called the ruler of the kings of the earth, and that goes with the firstborn from the dead, and both of them seem to be borrowed from Psalm 89. What does it mean that He's the ruler of the kings of the earth? Just that. He is the supreme ruler. Since He is God's preeminent Son, God will make Him the ruler over all other rulers, absolute sovereign over the rulers and all the affairs of the entire world. In fact, this unfolds in chapter 5. You might want to look at it in connection to this verse in chapter 1. We have a scene in heaven in chapter 5, and John's given a vision of the scene, and John sees in the vision God sitting on the throne, and in the hand of God is a scroll. The word actually is scroll in verse 1, and it's written on the inside and the outside. Now a scroll is usually written only on the inside. And, and rolled up, and as you unroll it, you read the inside. This scroll is written on the inside and on the outside, the inside and the back, and it is sealed with seven seals. When people made a will, they rolled up the will in a scroll, and they sealed it so that it could not be broken or opened uh, without everybody knowing it, and it could only be opened at the appropriate time when it was time to take title to the estate that had been left in the will. This is sealed seven times. It has seven seals. So to open it, you have to break seals seven times. This is the title deed to the universe, okay? This is the title deed to the universe, and it's in the hand of God. There is a usurper now who is in charge of it, the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of, uh, of the darkness of this world, Satan, who is the god of this world. He is in control of this world. But the title deed to it is in the hand of God in this vision. John saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? Who has the right? Who has the authority? Who has the privilege? Who is preeminent enough? Who ranks high enough to take the title to the universe out of the hand of God? Who is God's heir? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. No one had that right. No one had that privilege. John says, I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. For behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures who are angels and the elders who represent 
redeemed saints, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And He came and took the book out of the right hand of Him who sat on the throne. And when He had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are You to take the book and to break its seals, for You were slain and purchased for God with Your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a king, a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads times myriads ten, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing, and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped." Amazing scene. Go back to chapter 1. That right to take that scroll and take back the universe from the usurper. That right belongs only to the one who is the ruler of the kings of the earth, the one who is the absolute sovereign, the one who has a name above every name, a name at which every knee bows, the one who is head over all things, who possesses final authority. Drop down to verse 8. And here we find a fourth title given to our Lord. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Alpha and the Omega. It's repeated again in chapter 21, verse 6. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. There are 24 letters. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. What does it mean to say He's the He's the first letter and the last letter. You, you might say, well, it means that He is the Creator and the Consummator. That's true. Uh, you, it means that He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the starter and the finisher. Those things are true, but that's too thin an interpretation here. We're t- that could be said and will be said. You'll see it in a minute. This is talking about letters. Listen, between Alpha and Omega, there are... 22 Greek letters, and out of the total of those 24 letters, all words can be formed. All words can be formed. Therefore, all truth can be communicated. All truth can be conveyed. All wisdom can be articulated. To say that He is the Alpha and the Omega is to speak of His perfect knowledge, His omniscience. We we saw something of His omnipotence in the fact that He is the ruler of all the kings of the earth. And now we see His omniscience. He is the source of all knowledge, the source of all truth, the source of all wisdom. He knows perfectly all that is knowable. There isn't anything that can be known that He does not know. This is Alpha and Omega, the full alphabet with all of its possible expressions in words are known to Him. No word escapes his mind. No thought is beyond him. He knows perfectly all that is knowable, all that is conceivable. This will be apparent the next time he comes. People mocked his knowledge the first time they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's a Galilean, an uneducated man, hasn't been to the right schools. They scorned his teaching and his knowledge they rejected. The next time he comes, his perfect, consummate, vast, impenetrable knowledge will be on display. He will perfectly fulfill everything He ever said He would do, every judgment, every promise. He will fulfill. Every truth He ever articulated will come into clarity at the end. He is the Word. Number five, He is also described in verse 8 as the one who is and who was and who is to come, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And He will be 
again described with those words in the book of Revelation a couple of times. What is this? His eternality. His aseity. Theologians call it His aseity, His self-existence. We looked at it in John 1. He always was. His transcendent, eternal existence and presence. He's not defined by time. He's not confined by time. He's not defined by space. He's not confined by space. He is not influenced by any created reality or historical event. There are no external circumstances which shape Him or shape His thoughts. He is the one eternal, self-existent, transcendent One, completely uninfluenced control over space, time, energy, and matter, over time and over eternity as well. He is above and beyond. He is outside and away from all that He has ever made. We are seeing that this child in the manger is something more when unveiled. He is the one who always speaks the truth. He is God's heir. He is the ruler over every ruler in the world. He is the source of all truth, everything that is knowable, and He is eternal above and beyond all that is temporal and physical. Also, if that's not enough, Verse 8 ends with the fact that He is the Almighty. And now you have a full statement in one word about His omnipotence. He has all power. In other words, there is no power that He doesn't possess. There is no power beyond His power. He is the Almighty. He is the most powerful one. He has omnipotence, all power. Because He possesses all power, no one can hinder Him. Nothing can hinder Him. Not a person, not an event, not a collection of people, not any source of power, whether it's human or angelic. He has all power. No one can thwart Him. No one can hinder Him. No one can alter His plan. No one can prevent Him from doing what He wills to do, fulfilling what He promises to do. First time He came, He subjected Himself to human power. He subjected Himself to the power of men who beat Him and who murdered Him. The next time He comes with all power, He will destroy all His enemies and He'll do it with a word out of His mouth. He has the power then to establish His kingdom over the whole earth. And then He will display the power to destroy the entire universe and recreate a new heaven and a new earth. He is the Almighty. And that's an expression, obviously, of His deity because God in the Old Testament is called the Almighty. Go down to verse 17, and in verse 17, He says at the end of the verse, I am the first and the last. Now, this is where He's talking about beginnings and endings, historically. He is saying here, I am the living One, the next verse, and the living One. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades or the grave. I control life and I control death. That's what the, that's what the first and last means. I decide who lives and I decide who dies. I decide when people live and when they die. And not only that, I decide what happens to them at their death. I am the living one. I have the keys. I have the power of death and the afterlife because I am eternal. I decide who lives, who dies, when they live, when they die, and what happens to them when they die. This is incomprehensible power, incomprehensible authority. This is to say that if I say something, it will come to pass. If I warn you about a judgment, it will come to pass. I have the power to bring it to pass. And if I promise you something like the glories of heaven, it will come to pass. I have the power to fulfill everything I say. I have the right. I have the authority. I have the power. False gods come and go. False gods are the figment of human and demonic imagination. False gods pass off the scene all the time. People bow down to false gods, but false gods don't give life and false gods don't take life. False gods are just that, false gods. They're made out of wood. They don't exist. Demons may impersonate them and wield their power, but I alone control life and death. This is the unveiled Christ. 
Also in this same section, He introduces Himself in chapter 2, verse 1, as the One who holds the seven stars in His right hand and the One who walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is another designation of the unveiled Christ. The One who has the seven stars. What are the stars? They're ministers of the churches. That's what it says in chapter 1, verse 20. They're the, the, the ministers of the churches, the angelos. It's not heavenly angels but ministers. Uh, the seven churches are part of this section of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, seven actual churches. And um, they each had ministers as churches do. What He's saying is, I hold the ministers of My true church in My hand. And the seven lampstands, verse 20 says, are the seven churches. What is He saying here? I'm Lord over My church. I am Lord over the church. Those of us who are Christians uh, are amazed at how, how fast the world is changing, and not for good. We can, we can hardly keep up with how bad everything is getting. It's, it's just crumbling around us in a state of collapse. Uh, it may feel like people felt sometime in the Roman Empire when the whole thing was about to come down on their heads. Uh, th these are crushing times for people who have any sense of value, morality, family, who want to have any hope in the future for their children, their grandchildren. These are, these are the worst of times from a human viewpoint. It seems like Satan is running wild and nothing is restraining him. But let me tell you this, the Word of God never changes, never changes. The good news about grace to you is we don't have to adapt. We're not culturally driven. We don't have to shift our message to a, a, approach the culture. We don't have to come up with some kind of musical scheme to attract people. Uh, we, we don't have to change the way we look or the way we act or the way we talk. We don't change anything because the Word of God never changes. It speaks to every generation. It speaks to every culture. It speaks to every issue in human experience. So in a sense, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. The Word of God is still the same. God doesn't change. His Word does not change. That means that grace to you continues to do what it has always done. Unleash God's truth one verse at a time. And I will just tell you this, as we come to the end of this year, this has been the greatest year in our ministry yet. And we're beginning to feel already that next year may even exceed this year in opportunity, and not just in opportunity, but in response. Uh, as things get darker and more disturbing, uh, more people turn to the Word of God. You make it possible. You who support this ministry with your prayers and gifts, you sustain us. You're all we have. I, I want to say thank you for that. Thank you. You are the ones that carry this ministry in your hands to the ends of the earth. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for being partners with us.